say that uh, with humility because I doubt that you've ever heard this in your church. But you're going to hear it for the first time tonight, and I'm going to prove it sp not only spiritually, but scripturally. And then once I do this for you, you're going to see life in a different way through God's eyes. So it's going to be an exciting lesson. I've been so disappointed. One group went to the beach. There are 10 of the group from this class. Uh, one of my friends that helps me, her children and grandchild all have COVID. Um, another one had a ward night with her students. I mean, if I, it's so funny. The night I want you to hear more than any other night is when half the people disappear. I don't know what that is. Maybe y'all are the chosen ones, and, and God's not going to save them. Should I put that out on the, uh, should I say that out loud? I maybe should not. That might be a little discouraging <laughs> for them. But I tell you, when you commit to this, you really need to commit because it builds on each thing. And as we take, for example, the priesthood, begins with Abraham and with Melchizedek. And if we build that all the way to Hebrews 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, it's going to be mind-blowing to you. And also, we're going to see things in nature. In fact, go ahead and open your Bibles, if you have them, to Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 20, and then put a finger on 1 Corinthians 15.44. Um, because you're going to need that for something that I'm going to teach you. We'll also be in not only Exodus, but Leviticus. We'll be in Numbers. We're going to be in Genesis. We're going to be in John. Uh, I'm not sure I can even teach this. Would anybody like to teach this lesson for me? <laughs> it is really something. And we will not, if you're doing Beth Moore, you've done the lampstand, the table of showbread, and probably the altar. That will be combined with this. The main thing we're going to do tonight is the priesthood because we haven't really done the priesthood and we're going into the holy place. And the holy place, you don't want to enter there because the priesthood is in the outer court also on how they take the offerers um, offerings, their sacrifices, and then we want to consecrate the priest tonight. We want to see what that means and what it's going to mean for you, and we're even going to go to Matthew 22, which you ought to put your finger on also, where there's a wedding feast, and you know that wedding feast. The king invites all these people. Many are called, few are chosen. Many are invited into the kingdom, but many of them are too busy to come. They're out plowing the field, they're out, whatever, but they got the invitation, but they refuse it. And then he goes in the highways and byways and brings them in, and you'll notice that there's one that didn't have on the garment, the wedding garment. You cannot go to heaven without the wedding garment. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to know tonight, and you will know, and I'll guarantee you, it's first mentioned in Isaiah 61. You want another finger there. So you better have more fingers than you can find. But anyway, is Jesse here yet? Is he coming? Are Jesse and I think Robin said they were coming. Okay. Okay. Well, let me see then. Um, Tom. Would you come up here and pray for me, please? He's going to love this. Oh, boy. <laughs> I need big-time prayer tonight. This is Tom Summers. He's a dear friend and could build the tabernacle. <laughs> I would try. Do you want me to leave? Mm-hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us all together. And Lord, let the others that are not here hear it through the Zoom meeting, but Lord, let them hear it for you. And Lord, I ask that, um, thank you for Hope and all the things that she's doing for us right now, Lord. Thank you for all our friends. And just, Lord, thank you for Jesus and what he's, he's done for us and what, how he has opened up heaven 
that we can sh share with them. In the Lord's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, you know, in Luke 12, it said that the men were coming to see Jesus, and they said, we would see Jesus. And that's what I want you to see tonight. I want you to forget I'm up here, and I want you to see Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. We all know he came as a king because when he was born, the three wise men said he was born the king of the Jews. We know it was even on the cross when he died and at the court with Caiaphas. We know he's a prophet because he had a message, and he came directly to his own. His own received him not. But there are his prophet ministry. But what about his priestly ministry? Well, we know a priest cannot have a, a ministry without an altar and a sacrifice. And his sacrifice was himself, and his altar was the cross. But remember, a priest could not come in the natural from any order but the Aaronic order. That is from directly descended from Aaron. And you know that Jesus was, came from the line of Judah. So what are we going to do to be able to reconcile this priesthood? Because first we have Melchizedek in Genesis 14. And then we're going to move to the Aaronic priesthood. And then we're going to move to the great high priest of Jesus Christ in Hebrews 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Remember the earthly priesthood was ended by death. All the priests died, but Jesus never died. So his priesthood goes on for eternity. Also remember this as we're studying scripture and for your future reference, anytime you come to the Jordan, there's a change. And the priesthood changed when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by the true lineage of the Aaronic priesthood, which was John, his cousin, his uncle, I mean, that is um, John's father and mother, were from the Levitical tribe. And that was, John was supposed to be the next in line for the priesthood, but it changed when he saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when he baptized him to fill all the law and the prophets, because if he had not, if Jesus had done one thing out of order, he could not have been the sacrifice. Because he had to be without blemish, without defect. And at the Jordan, everything changes. But we'll talk about that. It changed when Joshua uh, crossed the Jordan, if you'll remember that time. Things changed when, uh, I believe it was Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan. And we're not here to talk about the Jordan, but we are here to talk about the priesthood. <clears throat> Let's look first at the lineage Again, to remind us where what this Levitical lineage is. But before that, look at this. This is the whole layout of the tabernacle. <clears throat> we see the gate. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the gate. We look at the door. Jesus says, I am the door. We look at the veil and he doesn't say, I am the veil. The veil is his body that was rent in two. And the day that he died, that four-inch veil, which two horses could not have split if they had both been pulling on the veil, from heaven to earth, it was split. So that you and I and whosoever could come into the Holy of Holies, which nobody was allowed to enter except the high priest on the day of atonement and you're going to find some other things uh, out about the day that he goes in there and we're going to talk about his vestments tonight and everything that he wore for the beauty of God and his holiness for holiness and beauty and we need to look back at Genesis and we see that before Adam and Eve fell they were made in the image of God they had the Shekinah or Shekinah glory over them. They never showed their nakedness. And then when they fell, 
are disconnected with God. They lost communication with God, and their nakedness was exposed. Y'all remember that? Okay, I talked to you about nakedness, the shame of their nakedness. And then we'll move into the priesthood, and we'll find out what God requires of the priest and the high priest to cover his nakedness, not excluding the fact that the tabernacle itself was covered with at least ten curtains, the outer one being a sea cow or a badger skin. Uh, different translations say different things. And it was so ugly on the outside. And then we learned that when Samuel went to the home of Jesse and saw six sons, Samuel's discernment as a prophet said, you have anybody else? And, and Jesse said, we have this son who's tending sheep out in the pasture. And that was the one. And God's principle here was God looks on the inside and man looks on the outside. Sadly to say, even, well, even in God's order, he does the Ark of the Covenant first. When you read chapters 24, 25, 26, etc., you're going to see the lineup of all the furnitures opposite from the way we're coming in. We're coming in like man would come in, but God always starts, and the Ark represents the throne of God. Five of these pieces are in the book of Revelation now. So not only is the tabernacle a visual, natural display of what we have uh, uh, then. It was real. It was authentic. It was substantive. But we see the spiritual part of the tabernacle, which we can't see, in the heavenlies. And we'll talk about that later, too. Now, Jacob and Leah. Will you move to the next one? Jacob and Leah, remember, had the son Levi. This is so critical for you to know this. Levi had three sons, Gershom, Koath, and Merari. Those were Levites, but they were different names and different tribes. Not tribes, but they were going to have different jobs in the tabernacle. Koath particularly was important because he, he was the one and his tribe that covered the pieces of furniture when they moved, and mainly with blue cloth. They had to move all the altar of incense. He had to move the tabernacle, I mean the uh, labor, the brazen altar, etc. And, and most of them had poles. The labor did not, but most of them had poles that stayed in the sides of these pieces of furniture so they could be carried. And they had to be carried by Levites or particularly the tribe of Koath. All right, we see that Amram and Jochebed had three children, Aaron, Moses, Miriam. Miriam was a prophetess. Moses was both prophet and priest because he was a prophet giving the word of God, the message of God to Pharaoh, all the kings, but he also ordained and consecrated his brother. And then he stayed in the role of prophet after that because Aaron became the head of the Aaronic priesthood. Now, over here we see the four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, and you can cut out the first two because they disobey God's instructions. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a consuming fire God. We think of God just being love. He is. But he is also a consuming fire. Fire often shows his approval. Fire also will burn you up and kill you. So we need to see God in, in all the facets that he is. And without Jesus, we would be killed immediately just for a trespass. We would be killed for a sin, for whatever not obeying God once or a small a thread being out of place in the tabernacle, a gold thread not being where God told him to put it, you would die. Serious, serious thing to know God and then not respect him or honor him or do what he calls you to do. All right, let's begin with the fact that Aaron was called God called him. No pastor should be ministering without a call. I had a call to be a teacher when I was 30-some years old, and my call was from Hosea 
my people perish from lack of knowledge. He didn't say the pagans or those over in Russia. He said, my people. Who are my people? My people called by my name are perishing for lack of knowledge. And tonight, you're going to get knowledge and therefore be accountable now in a different way than you've ever been before in your Christian walk and in the way you are led by the Spirit. All right, the priesthood began in Genesis 14, and it began with a, a man called Melchizedek, and this was a king, an actual king, and he, uh, Abraham paid tithes to him. If you want to open that scripture, you can. His name is King of Righteousness. Righteousness is going to be the operative word. And every time I say pure linen, you need to say righteousness. Because everything about the tabernacle is about God's righteousness. All the linen on the outside. The priest wore linen tunics and breeches. Uh, it, the bride is arrayed in fine linen in Revelation 19. Linen or righteousness is one of the garments at the wedding feast. And we'll talk about that in a second. But Abraham comes and gives him a tithe. And then 10%, not of his money, not just his money, of everything he had. If you'll read the scripture, it says of all he had. That means his time, his talents, his jewelry, his guns, his whatever, uh, all of it's owned by God. But God is expecting minimum 10. This is before the law. People tell me all the time, you don't have to tithe 10% anymore because, you know, you're under law. No, you weren't. He wasn't even a Jew yet. Abraham didn't come, become Jewish till uh, Genesis 17 when he made covenant with God. And then his son, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob, when he became Israel, the Israelites became, were the Jews. So anyway, then in New Testament, here was a picture. Here was in the natural. And then over the New Testament, God doesn't say you have to give 10%. He says you have to give your all. And that's in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I offer my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is my reasonable service, etc., etc. Now, he also says if you give, if you don't give freely, then don't give it to him. We saw that with the Egyptians when they were plundered and the Israelites went, got everything they had and built the tabernacle. And when they began to give, God said, Bring me this, bring me that, gold, silver, precious stones, fine linen, all the things he required. They overgave. And God said, you got to stop. We have too much. I bet there's not a church in the history of mankind that ever said, let's stop. Because we've got too much. And yet when it's done by God, orchestrated by God, called by God, he will give you more than you dreamed or imagined. All right, Aaron was chosen as a high priest by Moses and God, and the Kohathites and Korah hated him because they all thought they were priests. They were all Israelites, and he said they rebelled. This is Numbers 16. They rebelled against Moses and their leadership. Have you ever seen anybody rebel against their leadership? And God said, every one of you bring me a rod, and we're going to put the name of each tribe on it. We're going to put it before the ark, and the one that blossoms, buds, and blooms is my chosen leader. Well, this staff was not connected to any root at all. And overnight, Aaron's staff not only budded, but it bloomed and produced fruit. It was a symbol of God's authority and the resurrection. Eventually, then God just did away with a lot of the other leaders because they'd rebelled, and he had them put this rod in the Ark of the Covenant. That was one of the three things that went in the Ark of the Covenant. So that was Aaron's call, and God validated that call by taking that staff 
and making it bud, bloom, and produce fruit. And it was connected to nothing. It was a miracle. You can't take an old stick, put it down here, and watch it bud, bloom, and produce fruit if it has no connection to a root or to a plant. So that was the call of Aaron. And then we need to know about priests. Uh, when God started out the priesthood, he started in Genesis that Abraham, Isaac, Noah, etc., had a, made a sacrifice for themselves. And you'll see that in, a, in Genesis 12, Abraham begins to sacrifice. He gets to a place, he stops, builds an altar, and sacrifices. You know that. You've read that many times. Okay, so there was a priest for a man. And Abel and Cain brought their own sacrifices. Adam and Eve brought their own, but together they made a sacrifice. Of course, they put fig leaves on, and that's not going to count. That's self-righteousness. God has to, uh, he, he, it was a type of, he, he's going to make the sacrifice. But anyway, so there was a priest for a man. Then there's a priest for a family. Remember in Exodus 12, when the Passover lamb was brought and the families came and ate the lamb. Priest for a family. In the book of Exodus, we see a priest for a nation. So we're seeing an evolvement of the priesthood. Man, family, nation. And we see that Aaron and his four sons were the top of the priesthood. And they were for that is the priest for the nation. And then John the Baptist in John looks at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So we've gotten, we've evolved from Genesis 14 all the way to John when the priesthood begins to change from Aaronic to after the... Um, office of Melchizedek, which is said six or seven times in the book of he Hebrews. Jesus' priesthood is going to be copied after Melchizedek because Jesus is king of righteousness. Remember, Melchizedek was called the king of righteousness. He had no father or mother, had no lineage. It didn't say Jesus was Melchizedek. Brian, my minister, said Sunday, I was telling him I was preaching the priesthood. He said, you don't think Jesus is Melchizedek? I said, no, I don't. I know it. And he said, good. I'm glad to hear that. I thought, well, yeah. Anyway, so we see also, just to give you an aside, there was a ram in the thicket in Genesis 22. And some people say that ram, the sacrifice for Isaac, was Jesus in his adulthood because he died as an adult. However, we move over to, again, Exodus 12. There's a lamb for a family. And then we see in the tabernacle, there's a lamb for the nation. And then there's the lamb of the world. So we have priests all the way and there's sacrifice all the way. And then we'll see that Jesus was not only the lamb that was slain in Revelation. Nobody could open the scroll. Jesus comes out like a lamb that was slain. People are weeping. Who is going to do this? Who can open this scroll? And it was Jesus, the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth was laid, who comes out on the stage and saves all of us by what he did, which was preordained before the world was begun. It was preordained. It was um, that Jesus would die. It was the will of the Father. Okay. Now, when a high priest, Aaron now has the office of high priest, but I'm going to go on an aside and show you a principle of God and I want you to raise your hand if you've ever known this. But let's open to Romans 1.20. And let's look at what Paul wrote about invisible and visible things. In fact, everybody in the world is liable or actually is accountable for knowing there's a God. Because God is, is uh, visible in creation. God is visible in, in everything just about in this world. In fact, it says 
you know, that the heavens declare the glory of God. But when we look at Romans, you're going to see a principle that I'm going to develop for you. Um, I have so many scriptures marked. I'm about... I told Henry Thomas, and I'd like to have his brain for this lesson, and we can make an exchange. I don't think he wanted to. All right. We go to 120, and or look at 118, God's wrath on unrighteousness. Righteousness is your key word here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. God's anger against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They don't tell the truth about Jesus, God, etc. For what can be known about God is plain to them. That is, they have no excuse. They can see the results of God everywhere. So say you're an atheist, you're an insane person, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In other words, it's obvious there's a God. A God, not, let's say, the God. So they are without excuse. Now, I, that, I want us now to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 44, and this is gonna, what I'm going to blow your mind with. Okay, what God is saying in Romans, what Paul is saying is that in the Old Testament, there's a reality of a real man, a real woman, a real priesthood, people that existed, and that our senses can only conceive, we have five senses, of a reality, something we see. But Jesus is going to be a spiritual thing. And we're going to see what I'm talking about. Look at the verse 45 or 44. When you die, it says, it's talking about the resurrection. It is sown as a natural body. You're born with a natural body. But when you die and are raised, you're going to be raised with a what body? Can you see that? No, but the natural thing you can see. You can see your own body right now. Okay. If there is a natural body, there's a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, I talked to you about two Adams, first Adam, second Adam, became a living being. Adam and Eve were living beings, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. In other words, Jesus Christ, his spirit, we can't see, but we could see and touch a natural person. The priesthood is a shadow, but it's a reality of, of a man. You're born a natural birth. That's the natural. That's the, the first thing in Scripture. But when you're born again, that's a supernatural spiritual experience. You can't see it, can you? Okay. The priesthood was natural, but... The high priestly ministry of Christ, who's ever living to intercede for us by the right hand of God the Father, is supernatural. It's spiritual, correct? God is using everything in the Old Testament in the natural to make a picture of the spiritual in the New Testament. Solomon says, look at the ant. The ant is a picture of service, of steadfastness, endurance. How does he do? He gathers food in the winter. He does something. Job says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens are tangible. We can see it. See, we're limited in seeing the invisible. We can't see that. Now, the priesthood is a picture of eventually the ironic priesthood of what Jesus is going to be doing for eternity for us. Because once he dies and makes the sacrifice, the ultimate one on the cross, he goes to heaven, takes his blood, pleases the Father, which is all he ever came to do, that I may please the Father. And the Father says at the change in the Jordan, he says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then he goes to heaven at the ascension. He's seated on the right hand, ever living 
to be a priest to advise. He intercedes. A priest intercedes. A priest, um, one of his duties, Zacharias took the duty as one of the priest and he was at the altar of incense y'all remember that when the angel came and said you're going to have a son and he didn't believe him and what happened he was mute until the day that john the baptist was born okay a priest must be called cleansed clothed consecrated have compassion and be commissioned a true called priest now here's the interesting thing you are all priest first peter sec, second uh chapter i mean excuse me i think it's second peter five nine you are royal priesthood you have been chosen let's turn to that let me just show you that i want to be sure that i'm doing this correctly um all right priest peter Once you're regenerated, born again, accept Jesus' sacrifice, then you are a priest. And you will have some of the same callings on your life. All right? Um, here it is. 1 Peter uh, 2, 9. You are a chosen race. All of you that are born again. You are a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And what is your duty? Your duty as a Christian is to declare the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's one of the reasons when we get out of the outer court, we're going to go in and we'll see this. Because this is the first thing you're going to see when you're called out of darkness. Once you've accepted the blood sacrifice and you've been washed by the water of the word you're going to enter in the holy place and you will see that there are five pillars there and five is the number for grace and they're gold and if you're entering into this part of your christian walk you're going it's going to be costlier everything on the outside is brass or bronze with acacia wood Everything on the inside begins to be pure gold. Pure gold is the highest, most valuable thing uh, on the earth. In fact, I think it's worth $1,875. And the lampstand was 75 uh, pounds. It was a talent of gold. And I think 75 pounds. There are four ounces in a talent and I think the total cost today of that lampstand would be six hundred and something thousand dollars just for the lampstand. Just the lampstand. I do hope math. My my husband used to say that all the time. And I said, What is that? He said, You work it out like you want it to work out. And I said, Well, you're probably right. But anyway, it's worked. But you can do this math yourself. But I want you to bring it up today because the tabernacle is more costly than anything probably in the world today because of the pure gold and the diamonds and the rubies and the emeralds. and the. In fact, out in the outer court, I don't know whether it's the sockets, it's the, the bottom, the, what the uh, posts would fit into. What's that called, Tom? The little, it's, it would be something that the post would fit into to hold it up, and then the cords would go. That was solid silver, and silver is re means redemption. And the foundation of the tabernacle was built on the redemption of Jesus Christ. And what, what did Judas try to pay for Jesus? 30 pieces of silver and what did john say in the temple silver and gold have i none but what i have give i thee in the name of jesus christ stand up and walk he'd gotten even a greater gift he'd gotten the holy spirit by that time and that's the greatest gift ever given to the church all right let's move on we're going to now uh see that the how we're going to consecrate the high priest and his sons now the first thing you need to know is that go on go on past this honey all right this this is even better we i told you that i have to come back i'm ready to go forward 
last week I told you about the offerings, but there was one I did want to bring up to you because I don't think you realize what it means. The trespass has to do with a vow or swearing like our courts have taken on. When you put your hand on the Bible and you swear nothing but the truth, the truth, nothing but the truth, etc., so help me God, you're swearing by God's name. That's really what it means when you take the Lord's name in vain. It's not saying GD. That is also blasphemy. But the trespass offering has to do with your making a vow in God's name and not keeping it. In England, they call it aiding and abetting someone. Achan was killed. Do you remember who Achan was? Achan was in the book of Joshua. And Achan was uh, told by God, or the whole tri all of them were told by God, not to touch anything within Jericho. And he went in and got the garments and several other things and brought them in his tent. And so God, by discernment, told Joshua who it was. Achan confessed the sin. God killed the whole family. You know why? Because they knew what their father had done and not told it. So see... That this is what the trespass offering is. Also, sin offering is against God. You had to make the sin. These are obligatory offerings. The trespass offering is against your brother. And it's trespassing on property that's not yours. It's defiling your soul with bad movies, bad books where they blaspheme Jesus, and of course that means you can't watch anything today because every other word is Jesus, G-O-D, G-D, or the F word. The F word drives me up a tree. I don't think anybody can talk today without the F word. But it is. The, but God, God is so serious about this, so serious that when Jesus stood before Caiaphas, Remember, Caiaphas was not a direct descendant of Aaron. He was a corrupt high priest appointed by the government. But what does Romans 13, 14 say? That all governing authorities are set up by God. So, and he didn't talk to Caiaphas until Caiaphas said, I abjure you in the name of God that you speak to me. And Jesus answered him because Jesus knew Leviticus 5, 1. That you use the name of God, you're swearing. You must not swear by the name of God. But he had to answer him. Not only was he his authority, but also he had used the name of God. If Jesus had not answered him there, he would not have been the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He could not have died for our sin. So Satan really got him at the very end, even at the trial, trying for him to violate Scripture. So the answer to this is that you need to let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And you don't need to be making any vows using the name of God. And also, I remember my grandfather was a banker, and they never had contracts and things. He shook, when he gave a loan to someone, he just shook a name, and they made a, by the word, they gave their vow. And people kept their words then. Today, people don't keep anything. I've never seen anything like it. They have to have all, well, I don't know. I'm not going there. All right, let's move on and let's look at this priesthood. All right, the first thing I want to show you, go on to the next one. Uh, the philosophies of the world offer cheap alternatives to becoming right with God. The world teaches a person can approach God and become acceptable to God. That's not true. By doing the best he can, keeping rules and regulations of religion, by belonging to a certain religion or church, being faithful, or believing in the God worshipped by all religions who is said to be the same God no matter what he may be called, by following certain men who claim to be prophets of God. This is heresy. The brazen altar declares a different message. Atonement, reconciliation with God, the forgiveness of sin is necessary in order to approach and become acceptable to God. Man needs a Savior, a Savior who is perfect, who will sacrifice for man, and that was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fulfills the message and symbol of the brazen altar. And now would you go to the next one? 
All right, here's a picture of the brazen altar again, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to get right back to the priesthood. This is so enormous that I'm just, it's all I can do to keep my head straight. Um, I told you altar means uh, place of slaughter or death. A burnt offering, that's not obligatory. That's simply voluntary, just like Romans 12, 1 and 2. That is your offering, that you are a priest. You're offering your body as a living sacrifice. When you do that, you're telling God you're on that altar. He can tie your hands and feet down just like that animal, and he tied them to the horns. They tied the animal to the horns because the sacrifice was acceptable North, south, east, and west, and God's sacrifice is for all people in the north, south, east, and west. And the horns was, uh, denoted power. And so, um, and, and we'll talk about that later. And you see the staves that carried this particular altar. Last week, I gave you a list of the things about the brazen altar. And I doubt we're going to have time to go over all of them, but they are a great review for you. And also, um, I, I put in this, which is the Old Testament offerings fulfilled by Jesus. So every offering that Christ did fulfilled the requirement of the law. And these are the scriptures that go with that. So you ought to keep this to show you that Five is the number for grace. The grace of God fulfill the offerings through Jesus Christ's blood on the brazen altar. That's the place of sacrifice. That is the place of the blood. The blood's the most important thing in all scripture. The blood, in fact, it began in Genesis and, and God said, don't eat an animal with the blood because in the blood is life. Remember that? It said there's life in the blood. And then in the New Testament, it says, um, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So if Jesus had not shed his blood, not one of us would have a chance. All right, so you've gone through the blood and their guts everywhere and the offers and their slitting throats and it's so messy. You don't want to stay out in the court. And there's so many Christians that stay with the cross. That's the brazen altar. It's the most important, largest piece of furniture. But you don't want to stay there. Your Christian walk is to go, receive the blood of Christ, be washed in the labor, which is the cleansing of the word. And the priests had to be washed there all over when they first started their consecration. And then they had to wash every time they touched a sacrifice their hands and feet, or before they went into the holy place. And that's why Jesus at the Last Supper was talking about, you've already been cleaned, but he wanted to wash their feet. Feet represent the walk, how you walk as a Christian. And so you walk in the Spirit is how you walk. All right. There's the labor. We've got the cleansing of the water, blood, water, what came out of Jesus' side when he died, blood and water. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, let's not forget, and I'm taking you to Mount Sinai now, when Moses was up there 40 days and 40 nights, the people got tired of waiting. Have you ever been tired of waiting on God? Well, let me tell you what can happen. When he tells you to wait, he means to wait. And what he did is God heard all the stuff going down in the camp. And I love God so much because he said, your people, Moses, are doing all these bad things. He's put those people on Moses. He gave them to him. And then Moses was so cute. He said, wait a minute, don't you destroy him because of two things. Your reputation is at stake with the Egyptians, God. If you kill these people, you're going to think that you brought out all these Hebrews just to kill them. And that's not going to look good on your name. That's the first argument. And the second one, he said, you have covenant, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You cannot break covenant, God. So God said, okay. So Moses goes down and is infuriated because his becoming high priest brother, Aaron, has taken in the gold of everybody and decides he's thrown it in the fire. And he says, I don't know how that happened. I just threw that gold in and it came out of calf. Isn't that amazing? No template, no nothing, just good, good calf. And so God, I mean, Moses broke 
the cup broke the first testimonies. He broke them in half. It's the second ones that are in the Ark of the Covenant. And we will talk about that when we get to the Ark because now we know the rod's in the Ark. We know that the Covenant is in the Ark. But I did mention to you from uh, number 16 that remember the manna and the pot of manna was put in the Ark. But the symbolism of all that will have to come later. All right, so we see that the Levites were called aside by God. He told Moses, he said, See, call the Levites. Who's for me? Who's against me? That's the question today. Who's really for God and who's against him? And the Levites came and stood with God. And then God said, go kill all your brothers and all their families. And they did. And from that moment on, God set the Levites apart as an offering to him. They had no homes. They were given cities of refuge. They, were not, they had made no money. They worked in the tabernacle, and they were fed by the offerings. They were fed by the meat offerings, the meal offerings, the, the remains of the animals or the fat or whatever. That's the way the bread every Sunday, I mean every Sabbath when they brought the bread in and changed the bread, all that was for the priests. And Aaron and his sons were given to God, those five, and then everybody below them was given to help Aaron and his sons. You see the hierarchy. You see how it was done. Now, in that, go to the next one, honey, please. I've already done the coverings. Go on to the next. We've done that one. Go to the next one. Okay. We're now at the high priest and the, and the consecration, ordination of the high priest. Uh, now, first of all, I want you to get there were five in the high priest order, Aaron, his four sons. Now, the high priest wore a different outfit. That's why you see pastors in robes. And you see the Catholics in unbelievable robes. But you see, the high priest's outfit was made for beauty and holiness. And I told you that that started in the garden when Adam and Eve were clothed with the glory of God. And God, then the glory was removed when they sinned. And then they covered themselves with the fur God killed to cover them. And then uh, they had covered themselves with fig leaves, their own self-righteousness, which they have none of. But um, here, God is going to show us that the five stand for, you remember I told you there's the natural first, so we've got Aaron, four sons, are natural, real people in, as a picture of something in the New Testament. Can anybody tell me what is that picture and what verse it is? And I'm going to show you the spiritual part of the substance of the Old Testament. It's in Ephesians 4. God gave to the church apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, I'm mean, excuse me, Pastor, teacher, fivefold ministry of the church. It's a spiritual thing. It's a calling. Over here, the real thing. Over here, it's a spiritual thing to be over the church. Now, obviously, we have some of these people in our churches, but the point is, is we they're not named in the New Testament. They're the spiritual. People that run the church. Are you with me there? Fivefold ministry, hand ministry of the church, the fivefold Aaronic priesthood, Aaron, his four sons. So here is the natural, and over here in Ephesians 4, you've got the supernatural leaders of the church. All right, now let's look at him, and you're going to go, you see him in his beauty, you ought to be looking at your out, your handout of the priest and you're going to go go on down one more I just wanted you to see it I want you to see that the normal priest his sons wore this outfit the and they're all linen and linen stands for righteousness okay and so we see the turban we see the tunic the beautiful sash and then we see the high priest over here 
So there was a difference between Aaron and his sons. All the priests wore that outfit except for Aaron. Except for Aaron. And Aaron was dressed separately because he had a higher calling to whom much is given much will be required. The priests could have no blemish. They could have no broken bones. They, could have not, they couldn't have eczema. They couldn't have any skin disease. They could have no leprosy. They could have nothing wrong with them as, as much as a man can be perfect. And I've never met a perfect man. But I'm sure I will in the future when I go to heaven. All right, let's go on down to the next one. This is critical for you to know. Um, when Moses was ordaining and consecrating the priest, all the garments came from heaven to earth except the breeches. And these breeches were of linen. And what does linen mean? Righteousness. All right, now quickly turn with me to Isaiah 61. You may have to listen to this again on streaming because I know it's difficult, but it is a fact and it is the truth. Um, and I stand before God and it's scary as the heck to stand before him with every bit of this word. All right, in Isaiah 61, Isaiah speaking and talking about Jesus. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. That means poor in spirit. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, go on down to verse 3, and it says, To give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, and the oil of joy, it should be there. This ESV says gladness, but joy is in first chapter of Hebrews, and it should be in this translation. Instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. Now, you can't see the Holy Spirit, and that's the oil of joy. You can't see a garment of praise, and that's what God puts on you by the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing that will blow your mind. Go over to verse 6. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of God. Jump down to verse 10. And here are the wedding garments that were in Matthew 22 and why this underwear is the most important thing you'll ever have on. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. That is your undergarment. That's your foundation garment. What does linen mean? righteousness okay now he put the priest pulls this from earth up to his waist to cover his nakedness god wants that nakedness covered because they were uncovered and it was shameful in the garden but he's still not fully covered because his chest is still exposed. So then comes the robe of righteousness over. So the wedding garments, there are only two that the guy didn't have on at the wedding feast was the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness. Jesus came to earth and laid a foundation. There is no foundation laid but that of Jesus Christ. The foundation garment is to cover our nakedness. It's our salvation. But then we are covered by imputation, meaning God imputes his righteousness to us. So there are two garments you've got to have to get into heaven. All right. Now, um, so, wait a minute, go back to Aaron. All the priests had to wear that. And all of them had to keep that on at all times. Now, go to the next one now. All right. 
No, darling, I know what. Go back to the high priest so I can show you the different parts of that. All right, stop right there. All right, let's look at these garments because they are so important. Um, let me see where my pointer is. Just as Melchizedek was a real person, Aaron was a real person, and... Uh, and Jesus came to earth as a real person, but his high priestly ministry is in heaven, and you've never seen it. It's the spiritual part of the high priesthood. Great high, he's called the great high priest. All right, look at this. Um, now, notice they're barefooted. What happened when, when Moses was called in Exodus 3, take off your shoes this is holy ground and so they ministered barefooted all right here is that tunic the linen garment the garment of righteousness and underneath are the breeches made out of linen also but what do they call the foundation garment what does it represent your salvation why does god want you covered he doesn't want you covered by anything but his righteousness, and his salvation. And he, he is the only one that can cover your nakedness. You remember when, when even Noah, remember when he was lying naked and the sons walked in there and two of them had such a fear of God, they backed in and they covered him. The covering is extremely important. All right. Look at this next robe, and this is going to be mind-blowing too. This, it comes from, notice, all these come from heaven to earth, but the foundation goes from earth to heaven because they're pulled down from the feet up, and the rest of them come from heaven down or over the head. The blue, supposedly, or I know it is, is the Holy Spirit. Goodness gracious, can you imagine a priest or a minister ministering without the Holy Spirit? Blue represents the heavens, and God gave the Holy Spirit after Jesus would, died, and he said, you know, I have to go away in John 14, 15, 16, or the Holy Spirit will not come. And why was the Holy Spirit sent? Because eventually, here God wants to dwell with man here, but he's dwelling in in a sacred place that's separated by boundaries. People will die if they break through, go in the wrong place, come in the wrong way. But now Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to do all these things. And I gave it to you on your handout, all that the Spirit does. And I, you should have that in that collated thing that Robert did for me. All right, now, this robe... The blue robe is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And next week, when we talk about the lampstand, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and the light. It's another symbol of the Holy Spirit. Oil is the Spirit. And these priests were anointed with blood and oil. In fact, the high priest was anointed with blood on his right ear, his right thumb, and his right toe. And I told you why. You sanctified his hearing. You sanctified his service. You set apart his walk. He had to be different from anyone else. And, of course, Jesus' walk was different from anybody else's. Um, they had bells and pomegranates on this robe. It is not true, and I told you this myself, and it's not true that he wore this garment into the Holy of Holies and that the, it, they tied a rope around his uh, ankle. In fact, one of the commentaries said that it's not true because if you'll read carefully in Exodus, it says that Aaron ministered in this garment in the holy place, not Holy of Holies. In the holy place... He ministered in full regalia, all this. But in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, he would never have gone in there with bells clanging, etc. That was such a holy time. You've taken the sins of the world and his own sin into the Holy of Holies. It is not true that you've heard before. And I can show you next week in Scripture. Now, 
the pomegranate and the bell, if the pomegranate were not between the bells, they would clang with each other, would they not? All right, when you look at the um, gift uh, chapter, uh, though I speak with the tongues of angels and have not love, I am as a clanging brass and a cymbal. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit is represented with the pomegranate. The bell represents the um, gifts. And I want you to know that in the church, the reason we have such division is there's no fruit between these people that have different gifts. And so people clang against each other in the church. They, run, they are jealous. They're competitive. They don't want anybody to have more than they do or be a better teacher, a better evangelist, or whatever. But the reason God put those in there is to separate them. The gifts are separated from the fruit, but the fruit must run the gift. And what are the fruit, 522, of the Spirit? Who can name them? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, so that, 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 self-control. Okay, always there's a law in Scripture, and actually the United States government adopted it with a bill, that whatever is first on any cereal, any ingredient, is what that thing's made of, correct? If you have a shampoo and you paid $75 for it, you turn it around, it says first thing is water, you paid $75 for water. Okay, in Scripture, the first thing mentioned in the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. So that has to touch everything else in that fruit, in the fruit. And God is love, correct? Okay, now the gifts cannot operate without the love of God directing them. And that's what the Holy Spirit has those gifts, and that's why the pomegranate and the fruit are on the uh, hem of the garment. All right, moving on, we see here, this is called the ephod. And this garment is somewhat attached to the ephod here with the stones, attached to the epaulets and stones, and the urim and thummim. And I have, uh, I have these uh, to show you what they're like. But all this material is woven, and it is made of the same colors in the gate, in the uh, ceiling, in all these gold, scarlet, blue, and white. And, of course, the linen is, uh, is from Egypt, and it's, uh, it was the finest linen ever made. Then it, it was almost pure white. It wasn't like linen today that has sort of a off-white look. All right. That sash is also sort of attached. What in the world? Attached to this that holds this all together. Now, let's look here. The epaulets have six stones each in onyx, and they're the tribes by birth order. So, if you remember in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 9, it says that wonderful counselor, prince of peace, everlasting God, who carries us, the government is on his Shoulders, okay, that is the high priest is representing the spiritual of Christ. That's the substance, the real thing, the onyx stones. All right, they're mounted in gold. They have chains that attach. And then I ordered this. This is your ephod. And the tribes are carried over the heart of the high priest. So the stone representing each of the tribes is always for him to pray, to always be in prayer for those tribes. And in Hebrew, you, you go from right to left. So here is Judah. And I don't, I'm not going to go in each of the stones. If you ever have me teach the 12 tribes of, of, the, of Jacob, you will... It, it is mind-blowing. I can take each one of them through um, all the Bible, all 66 books. 
So you would start with Reuben, who was the firstborn. And I don't remember which one it is. And I have memorized the stones because if you go to different translations, they're going to call the stones different things. But each stone was a birthstone of that tribe. That's where we get birthstones and all that kind of thing. In the back of this ephod, or breast piece is what this is called, was a pocket. And in that pocket, the high priest had two stones called the Urim and the Thummim. And one it means perf- lights and perfections. Nobody knows how this operated. I've read all kinds of opinions. But the high priest would sit down and he would drop the stones in his lap, so they say. And it, the, the person would come up with a question, uh, am I going to get married? The high priest, if this stone would light up, yes. Should I buy a house? Yes. Or this would light up. And this is the way they got the will of God. Since Jesus Christ is the word, and his word is the will of God, that's how we get God's will. All right, so this was hidden here, and this was over the high priest's breast, called the breast piece. And then... But you see the accountability of the high priest. Now, let's look at his headdress. It was made of fine linen, which means righteousness. And here was holy to the Lord. That was on the gold band, solid gold band around his head. That means your mind is holy to the Lord. And that it is in your mind that you get in trouble. Y'all all know that. It's how you think. As a man thinketh, so he is. And so what you do is you let the Word of God every day cleanse you, but also memorizing and meditating on that Word, you can replace bad thoughts with the thoughts of God. All right, that is the high priest. Now, would you go to the next one, please? I showed you this. This is what the high priest wore in the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement when he had to atone for his own sin and also the sin of the nation. Uh, And then this is what he wore most of the time. Once the priest stripped, he was out of office. He could live like an ordinary person. Have y'all noticed how our ministers dress today? Do you see many suits anymore? What do you see? Ragged jeans and a shirt? I'm telling you, there was a reason the high priest was separated. He had a calling, and he was appointed by God, and every minister has a calling and appointed by God. You say, well, that doesn't count. That was Old Testament. What did I just teach you about what God shows you in the natural and then over here? the supernatural, and of course, God clothes us all with salvation garments and with the garment of righteousness, and then on the day of Pentecost, if you are born again, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came into you when you were regenerated, converted, born again, whatever your denomination wants to call it. I prefer to call it scriptural, but that means that this your first birth was the natural from your mother, but your second birth is spiritual. There was a first Adam. Jesus is the second Adam. There was a priesthood that existed, the Aaronic, until the Roman times. And then Jesus takes on the priesthood of Melchizedek, which means no father, no mother, no lineage, and that he would bring bread and wine, and we will see the bread and wine when we go to the table of showbread. <clears throat> but everything about Jesus' great high priesthood was made after the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus did not fulfill the man's law of priesthood, which was he had to descend from Aaron because he descended from Judah. But what he did was take on the order of the first priesthood, which when Aaron came and paid tithes to Abraham. I know this is hard. 
I know this is difficult, but I, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have learned something tonight. Um, let's see if what else. Let's go on to the next one, honey. Okay, go to the next one. Let's see. All right, now let's look at the duties of the high priest. The duties are uh, Aaron really supervised all the priests. That was his job. Uh, he had he offered the gifts and sacrifices. He made atonement. Sorry, make made. He inquired of God for the people with the Urim and Thummim. He consecrated the Levites. He anointed kings. Blessed people presided over the courts. Go to the um, to the regular priest. The next one. All right. Look at the priest. These are his sons, and remember, two of them were killed. Because they didn't do what God told them to do. Son of Aaron, sanctified to office, publicly set apart. The office went on in perpetually. No physical blemishes. And the genealogy, they had to have a genealogy that they came from Aaron. <clears throat> the duties, they keep the tabernacle, light lamps, continue the fire, cover the furniture, burn the incense, offer sacrifices, bless the people, purify the unclean. And they also uh, had to meet an adulteress or an adulterer at the gate to decide if her husband has accused her of adultery. And by the way, adultery is a trespass sin. You have sinned against, um, if you've committed adultery, you've sinned against that woman or that man. And so that, it has to be forgiven. You will pay for that. You will pay a huge price for that. David sinned. In adultery, and what was the cost? His only son, his first son. Well, that's for war. That wasn't for the sin of adultery. That's because he was a man of blood. Okay. He couldn't build the, the temple for his God. Okay, what I'm saying is sin has great consequences. And if people knew in the church what they were doing... It's just, if it hadn't been for the blood of Jesus and it hadn't been for the righteousness of God that's imputed to us, y'all, we'd all be dead. And we deserve to be dead. But because of his mercy and because of his blood, we are alive and able to... And, and just because you think he's overlooking all these murders of abortion, all these things that are going on, if you think he's overlooking that... You are badly mistaken because the judgment of God will come on the house of God first. And it's already coming. How many churches are dying? How many denominations are losing thousands of people a year? You know what the word of the Lord is? Ichabod. The glory has departed. And what is the glory? The Shekinah glory of God is in the Ark of the Covenant. That's where that pillar of fire was and the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of cloud. It's the glory of God. It's the light of God. And when we go into the lampstand, we're going to see God's light and what it means. Goodness gracious, it's 10 to 8. Y'all, I'm sorry. I'm going to quit. All right, go to the next one. This is where we go into the holy place. And I'm going to talk more about the priest again because it is incredibly important important that you know that Moses uh, did the consecration and then became a prophet. He did the priestly job for God. And then the sons were also set apart for priestly duties. And if you are called by God, you're set apart. And <clears throat> I, I told you I was called when I was 32 or 3 years old. That's when I surrendered to Christ. And uh, almost immediately, God gave me the word, my people perish from lack of knowledge. And almost immediately, I resigned from everything I was doing in the community. And I began to study, and I began to set aside time, and I took classes under you wouldn't believe the classes I've taken and the things I've learned and the books I've read. And somebody said, oh, it's too bad you didn't go to seminary. I said, are you kidding me? I went to the seminary of the Holy Spirit. That's so superior to regular seminary. It's not funny. I, I have learned from the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but I've also spent hours in study. I mean, I didn't it didn't just 
come in from heaven and say one day, oh, there you are, you can teach. No, it's taken hours and hours and hours of study, still does. But I also do something else. I get up early, I get in the Word, I memorize the Word, and I read my Bible because that's my bread. I also daily, almost, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I offer my body as a living sacrifice daily, daily. And, and the next thing I do is I ask the Holy Spirit to fill me because Ephesians 4 tells us that we are to be daily filled with the Spirit. It's not a one-time event. It's a one-time event to be born again and sealed, sealed with the Spirit. But next week, I'm going to tell you how you keep in the Spirit. And it is by the grace of God. All right, here's the entrance into the holy place. Look at the cherubim here. You see the ties, and you see this. Now we've got the pillars of gold, and five is the number for grace. By the grace of God, you're going to be able to have the light of God, the provision of God, and the prayers of God in the holy place. Uh, go to the next one. Let's see. All right, here's what we'll see next week. We're going to see the lampstand, which is, by the way, made of 66 parts. What do y'all study that is made of 66 books? It's hammered gold, one talent. It is solid gold, but e each of the carvings or whatever you would call it, there's 66. Um, sure. They pull the, they just pull the thing up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question. I wonder that myself at times. All right. Now, the place of worship, they are across from each other. This light lights the whole holy place. And it is olive oil pressed out. Gethsemane means place of pressing, pressed out, pressed out of, and Jesus was pressed out of himself in the garden and the oil uh, is what they used to light these lamps. And, and Not a lamp. It's not a lamp. It's a lamp stand, and this is real fire. And the priest kept that always lighted from the brazen altar. Remember, you can't light anything. If I preach not the cross, woe is me. So every preacher, every Sunday, should end with the cross. There's never to be a sermon that does not have the cross first as the focal point. And then the other sermons should, I mean, the other words should follow. And then here's the bread, your provision. I am the bread. I am the light of the world. And then the fire comes from the brazen altar here. And we're going to stop because I may have to go get a massage. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Holy Father, I'm sure I fell short of all that you have taught me, but I, and I ask that you cover over anything that I've missed. I ask that everything I said would glorify God. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity of learning your word, of being set apart years ago to be a teacher. And, and you say in James, let there not be many teachers. They have the higher accountability. And God, it is a huge accountability as one of the fivefold ministries of the hand ministry. And so, Father, when I touch the things of God, I, I almost tremble. Uh, Father, I just want to thank you for filling me with your spirit and doing the work you've done in me over these years, far from perfect, but certainly desiring to draw nigh to you. The word is, we draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to us. Father, I know that you can do more than we ever dreamed or imagined. You can present us blameless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy. Father, help us all to produce fruit through the Holy Spirit in each one of us and to not be clanging bells and, and cymbals and not show love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We know that the tabernacle is a place of worship. It's the place of fellowship. But at the cross, it was a place of reconciliation. And Father, I ask today that we would all not trespass against you by not forgiving our brothers and sisters. 
And many of us have many things that we could say, but God. But then God says, but the king forgave you. And you turn around and will not forgive. And if, I, if you don't forgive, I will not forgive. So, Father, I ask that the fear of God fall on all of us tonight, that we would truly, through your grace, through your spirit, forgive those that have sinned against us and that we've sinned against. Father, fill us with your spirit. Keep us in the love of God. And, Father, most of all, will the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face. Lord, bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.